It's great to hear the Peter Thanos name, just a list, and that's Hussein Ech. Hello, everyone. Um, it's good to have you all here. My name is Peter. I'm from Hussein Ech, and I'm, yeah, uh, coming in live from the South Island of Vancouver Island in Hussein Ech and Lekwungen territories. Hi, and I'm Maureen. I'm the co host, and I am casting to you live today from Richmond, DC, the unceded territory of the Kitsi. Tuasin, Kwantlen, and Musqueam First People, First Nations, um, here on the Lower Mainland. So really glad to be here. Yes, oh. welcome back to Coastal Insights. Right, and it's like every week we love to hear where everyone is visiting from. Um, we've been really fortunate to get people from all over the world and, and far reaching. And so uh, if you could share in your comments where you're casting from, and the territories that you're casting from, if you know that, it'd be great to hear. Um, and as you're doing that, I'm gonna introduce our live classroom attendee for this week. I'm um, just gonna bring them up here. All right, we have Half Moon Bay. You guys wanna introduce yourselves? Um, We'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Tikal people. We recognize and respect the Tikal people, the traditional truth of the clan, and the concerning relationship that has existed between the Tikal and their traditional characters since time immemorial. Um, my name is Davia, and I am from um, Johannesburg, South Africa. We are a great five six staff at Harpoon Bay Elementary Community School at, in Harpoon Bay, British Columbia. We live on the beautiful Sunshine Coast, North of Asia. Thank you to our hosts, Maureen Rose and Peter Underwood and the Rain Coast Foundation. Thank you to today's guests, Mercedes and Rob. We look forward to you today. Uh, oh, no. Oh, that's thank you. Wow. you. That was beautiful. <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much. Very warm welcome. And uh, I'd love to go to Sunshine Coast. Sounds like a beautiful yeah. place. But yeah, really glad to have you on today. Um, lots of really great guests and people on. So uh, we have a full show today. We're, uh, yes, we got some people from, from all over, from uh, Tsok Nations, Vancouver Islands, and the Kwangan Territories, uh, South Island District Education Center, uh, I think that's them, grade seven, and uh, yeah, a few other schools, Pacific School of in uh, Innovation and Inquiry, and the Sides, that's from Kitasu, mm -hmm. and oh, from Spirit Bear Lodge, <laughs> and Pender Island, good to have you all here. Oh, awesome. Thanks for joining everyone. Yeah, we have so many great people here today from all over um, and a really full show today. So today, uh, if you're if you're new to Coastal Insights, our whole program is focused on really connecting people to coastal British Columbia and the culture and conservation. And we do that using this two eyed scene framework. And so with Rain Coast and my background, we I've worked a lot in scientific research. Um, and learning about the environment from the academic perspective. And so with a lot of the topics we highlight, um, we bring up some of that learning using that lens. And Peter? Yes, and uh, yeah, um, the lens is a really um, interesting and important uh, kind of thing to be thinking about. And uh, because like indigenous people have been here on the coast uh, for you know centuries, millennia, and the environment has, you know, followed so many patterns over the years that Indigenous people have kind of um, adapted around and, and and kind of been connected to for uh, since time immemorial. So uh, Indigenous people are, yeah, you know, the most connected to, to these lands and waters. And um, yeah, it's really great to have so many great Indigenous uh, stewards and, and guests to come speak about, you know, their work in their territories. and and to learn from them and to kind of connect with other nations too, see what's going on, yeah, all over the coast. So learning from all these different perspectives and lenses really helps open up um, the natural world and open up opportunities to understand how we can move forward with stewardship and conservation 
using so many different knowledge systems. Um, so today, our episode, it's a bittersweet because it's our final episode and it's been such a fun journey to learn alongside everybody um, on this series. But very excited because we have an episode fully dedicated to inspiring young people. And with the education programs that we do with Raincoast, our whole goal is to help inspire and empower um, the next generation of leaders. But often I find with this program, you encounter so many youth that have inspired me. And so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first guest who is from the Hulitsum, Hulitsum uh, First Nations and also an honorary member of the Tuasin First Nation. And she, there you go, <laughs> Robin Butt. And I've had the privilege to work with Robin with piloting our youth stewardship program on Tuasin First Nations lands last summer where Robin was a program lead um, and really rocked it as the program lead, helping engage young Tuasin First Nation youth with understanding lands and the waters in the area and stewardship. And so, yeah, um, it's an honor to have today Robin Buss, who's gonna share her story um, and her passion uh, of, of the lands and the waters in our area. So I'm gonna bring Robin on. There you go. Hey, Robin, how's it going? Good, hi, everyone. Good. So I'm gonna just pass it off to you and you can take it away. Okay, um, I'm gonna share my screen. One second here. Bear with me for a moment. Can okay, there it is. All right. I one second. No. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> no, nope, we see it. Okay, there we go. That's better, right? It takes up the whole screen now. Okay. Wait, one second. <laughs> it was on the screen a second ago. Now you can't see it, hey? I can't see it. Do you want to try sharing again? One sec. Um, I might have to change ah, the type of view it's in. One sec. Can you see it now? No. No? <laughs> Hold on. We saw it uh, earlier, though. Oh my goodness, hold on one second. Okay. Is it working yet? Yeah, see it. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I'm worried that if I change the views, it's going to do that again. I think you can try it. I think it worked last time. Is it how's okay. now? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Perfect. Just, okay, okay, thank okay. you everybody, my apologies. <laughs> um, my name is Robin Buss. I am tuning in from home in the traditional territory of the Tuasin First Nation and the surrounding and overlapping unceded territories of Musqueam, Keitsi, and Samiamo First Nations, just to name a few, and many more surrounding Coast Salish communities. I am Hulitsum First Nation from Canoe Pass and my oops, wrong mouse thingy, sorry, my bad. Okay. Um, and I have been uh, living and a part of the Tawasan First Nation community since I was a little girl. Um, growing up in TFN territory, I've had the opportunity to be immersed in my culture through ceremonies, community gatherings, and fishing with my family. Um, just on the screen here is just uh, some pictures of me being me um, out on the boat with my cousin. Uh, Ruby, who does contract work. Here's a beautiful picture of Canoe Pass at Brunswick Point in uh, Ladner, BC. Below is the TFN beachfront. And, um, and down in the corner, I was, I'm skinning a moose for um, last hunting season, my first time. That was really exciting. <laughs> and um, this is a photo of me and my cousin and my papa on the boat when we were li really little. So I've been enjoying the water ever since I can remember. Um, while I was working in the lands department uh, for Tuasin First Nation, I actually came across um, in the community notice, um, a notice for the um, Indigenous Land Stewardship Program at the Native Education College, and to decided to go back to school after 10 years um, 
it was a little intimidating, but NEC is a wonderful school and I felt so comfortable going back there to learn. Um, some of the classes in my program included intro to land stewardship, indigenous environmental knowledge, ecosystems, climate change adaptation, indigenous law and governance and the environment. That one was one of my favorites. Um, and during the program, I acquired valuable knowledge I carry with me every day. And I mean that every day. <laughs> um, it fuels my passion for stewardship and it has led me down the path I am right now. Um, these, uh, a couple photos here, um, we got to work on field journals and uh, this is an image right in the middle that I drew of a chum salmon. Um, this uh, image with the big stump here, this is actually out at uh, Brunswick Point. Um, I was just um, drawing what I saw and uh, learning how to collect data and um, write down my observations and stuff. Um, on the left here is us trekking through some wooded area. Um, we actually went to uh, Squamish Lilwat Cultural Center for a field trip and also visited, visited this really cool um, lodging area where they're completely off the grid so they have like their own electrical system and water system it's it was really really cool i really enjoyed myself um spending time at the at nec it was uh, fabulous um but uh during my time at nec i actually had a meeting with maureen vo where we talked about um bringing a stewardship program to tawasan first nation and it was super exciting um i didn't they see it happening so soon but for it to come to us so soon in 2020 was like it was a dream come true really um so i'm just going to share with you uh some of the things we did uh during our program um week one um i would I, so i would have the students for two days a week and um most days i either had dave scott he was um on a couple episodes before me, um, Coastal Insights episodes. He was super great, lots of help. And Maureen also helped me for a few days. Um, our first week we went out and um, set our first minnow traps. We actually used KFC from lunch um, and it worked well. As you can see, we have a, a stickleback and there. this is called a sculpin or a bullhead down in the corner here. And um, just some of our students out um, collecting the, um, the minnow traps from the slough there. And we, we, we left it over lunchtime or for a little bit. So we made a little sign and um, so no one would touch our gear. Um, I'm moving on. Uh, week two, we talked about indigenous plants. Um, we, had, we, went with, uh, we went harvesting with our TFN elder and knowledge keeper, Barb. We, she helped us gather cherry wood and uh, rocks from the beach and supplied us with some cedar lashings where we recreated traditional net weights um, that would have been used by our ancestors um, for fishing, which was really cool. This was actually an idea brought to me by a good friend of mine, Victoria. And I was super happy that um, she gave me this idea and I was able to pass it along to Raincoast and we were able to make it happen. It was just, it's so cool. Um, for week three, we had, we had the opportunity to go out with um, one of the Raincoast crews and help collect um, uh, data on the intertidal zones um, in the uh, eel, there's like eelgrass and um, sand flats areas. And we um, helped identify um, all the little fish with these little booklets. And um, we used a purse seine. So they let the net out, um, as you can see with the yellow corks. And there's actually a line that goes through the bottom and you cinch it all tight and it scoops everything up. And then we would go through and um, identify all the little uh, fish species. That was super fun. Um, Super, yes, super happy I got to bring the students out on the water. Um, oh, sorry, I just forgot to mention, um, oh no, I went too far. Ah, ah. Um, we also had um, Misty from Raincoast come and do a beautiful presentation about the Southern res resident killer whales. I just wanted to mention that. I don't have any photos, unfortunately, but that was super incredible as well. She is super amazing. She actually, I think she came out with us one day too, purse staining. Um, 
week four, we talked about salmon in watersheds. Dave uh, spoke to us about um, Chinook and his work that he's been doing in the Fraser River estuary for many years now. He even brought us some guests from UBC, which were some juvenile Chinook down in the left corner here. That was so much fun. Um, we also had, I also brought in two TFN guest knowledge keepers, Victoria and Ruby down at, this is all three of us actually down in the middle photo here. They, I brought them in to tell their journeys as being skippers of their own boats. Um, and this photo is actually from the first fish ceremony opening where we uh, uh, catch the first fish of the year and use those spring salmon to um, have a ceremony and give thanks for the fish returning every year. Um, it was great to be a part of that and have an all woman crew. <laughs> um, these other couple pictures are from when we went to check out the slough by Big Splash and we're surprised to find so many little fish in the slough. Um, it was just really exciting finding out like what is just like literally in our backyards or like in these ditches that you just think are, oh, it's just a ditch, but there's actually, there's so many living creatures in there. Just so much cool stuff. Um, we got to go out purse sailing again um, the next week. Um, the students actually went whale watching one of the days and then we were able to go out purse sailing another day. Um, so here's just some more pictures from that. Um, oh, that's what was super exciting about this time. One of our operators couldn't make it and I was able to call my cousin Ruby, um, who's a fabulous operator and she saves the day and was able to take us out. So thank you, Ruby, for that. That was awesome. Um, I just, yeah, it was super great to have TFN members um, participate in stuff like this. So yeah, <laughs> um, moving on. Uh, week six, we had, we started on Birds of BC. We had, um, we had, sorry, uh, TFN guest hunter, Zach, he came in and demonstrated his bow for us. He also processed a mallard duck for us, which was really, really cool. Um, in this um, crazy picture in the corner here, that's actually, it's gizzard and you can see all the sediments inside there and that's how they break their food up. Um, so I thought that was super cool. Um, we also had um, wonderful guests from Birds Canada come. They, they actually brought, um, so James and Carolyn is who came. Um, they, we discussed uh, um, birds and why they're so interesting. Um, they, they brought um, binoculars for us and a spotting scope for us to check out. And that's what you see in these uh, couple images down at the bottom. Um, there were some Gadwell ducks in our marsh area here. And then this picture here is, that's actually a Northern Harrier who was flying around hunting while we were out there. And we actually witnessed it catch some prey and sit there and eat it right in front of us. So we got to see him eat a meal and that's what we were seeing through the scope there. That was super exciting too. Um, and then um, for our last week, we continued with birds and we had Ducks Unlimited Canada join us for a field trip to the George Sea Rifle Migratory Bird Sanctuary. Um, saw all kinds of ducks there. And my favorite are these little guys. These are, I apologize, I don't know all their specific names, but they're types of Dunlins or sandpipers and they're little shore birds with their tiny little skinny feet and they run around on the shore and that they're the ones that eat the biofilm um, that is very important to their um, fueling up when they stop on their migratory um, stop, which is where we are located is a very, um, important stop on the migratory path, Pacific Flyway. Um, in the middle here, we have a wood duck. Um, his plumage isn't quite all there because it's the wrong time of year, but normally they have very beautiful, intricate plumage on their heads, but um, but that's okay. You'll see it sometime, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so more recently, um, I have been, I am now the junior territory management coordinator for Tawasan First Nation. Um, sorry, before I get into that, I just wanted to say this opportunity to work with Rank Host and TFN to bring a stewardship program to my home community has been a dream come true. 
I was able to put to good use the knowledge and skills I had been building in my nine month Indigenous Land Stewardship Program at NEC and prove to myself that I'm on the right path. I have been finding my passion for the land over the last couple of years and to be able to share that passion with the youth and community and my community has been uplifting, encouraging and exciting. I was honestly nervous to have such a big responsibility developing and implementing an entire program, but with the support and encouragement from Raincoast and their amazing staff, I had no problem and felt like I was right for the position. This opportunity has given me so much self-confidence in my abilities to take on projects and use my communication skills and leadership skills to and reassurance that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, so I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to have been able to put on such an incredible program. Um, and I just had to make sure I mentioned that before I moved on, sorry. Um, but more recently, yes, I am the Junior Territory Management Coordinator for Tawasin First Nation, where I read and respond to referrals, as well as participate in and participate in field work and provide input for potential stewardship and monitoring programs. Um, here are some images um, from this right here. I'm actually doing eel grass transplant where um, divers harvested eelgrass, and then we tie them, twist tie them to washers, and then they go plant them elsewhere to create eelgrass beds. Um, that was really cool work. Um, we, this, um, I have a video here from an, the Ula Kintessette contract that I've been working with my cousin Ruby. We go out and do 15 minute sets um, every second day uh, to, um, for, yeah, for Ulakin to find out um, numbers and, and stuff. Um, I actually have a little video here that I'd like to show you so you can see what an Ulakin looks like. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they're super cute. <laughs> um, just, just to explain these other images, um, this is one of my favorite spots to come check out the ducks. Um, it's in Boundary Bay. Um, you, it's hard to tell in this image, but there are some American widgeons along with mallards, which everybody's very familiar with. And there's actually one of my favorites. There's some bustleheads in there too. Um, and I also included this picture of these two pictures of this is a sculpin or bullhead. And if you can remember from my beginning slide from the very first one, we caught a little teeny tiny one in the that was showing in the viewfinder. But this one was so big, I'd never seen ones that big, and it it um, it buzzed or like vibrated in my hand, and that's what the bigger adults do apparently. Um, I still have to look into that because that was super super weird, but it felt really cool. But um, I thought I had to show you guys that cool picture because he's so big. Um, and just to ah, I didn't want to play that again. Sorry. <laughs> um, just to wrap things. No. Okay. Where is my? There. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just to wrap things up. I wanted to share you some share with you guys um, some wonderful books that have really sparked my interest in in plants and vegetation and trees and just nature itself. Um, we were assigned to read Braiding Sweetgrass in school, and it's just an incredibly beautiful book. Um, and right now, I am reading The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, you will never walk into a forest and the same way again. It's it's so incredible. Trees are wonderful beings and I've always loved trees and I just love them even more. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I share these books with you because they've made me more aware of nature and my surroundings. And I truly, truly believe if you make yourself aware, you have more of an opportunity to care. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, um, get out there and learn and find out what's going on around you and what's happening on your lands and and go learn and build that knowledge and become more aware so you can care. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Robin. And just to give you a little bit more background too with the, the program that we, we helped 
pilot together. Robin, this was her the first time being in a position like that where it was a lead and uh, having lots of responsibility of planning a program. And there wasn't that much time actually to <laughs> plan it. So she was able to really pull through and bring this whole program together um, and make it amazing. So the youth definitely, you could see it in, in the excitement of the youth that participated. Um, it just turned out far beyond anyone's expectations. So it was amazing and you were the perfect lead for Thank it. You. So oh, I forgot to mention um, my sister who was in the program in the summertime is now working as a technician for migratory bird count for a um, project right now. So that, that's cool to see. And we actually, I also wanted to mention, we have way more TFN members uh, doing technician positions and out on the land and learning more and more. And it's it's just great. It makes me so happy. So that's, yeah, to that. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, that, that you were just part of um, spearheading a lot of these initiatives as well. And so one question I'll launch off to you before we move on. We'll have questions for, for everyone at the end, but um, what types of projects would you like to see more with TFN youth and uh, field monitoring or stewardship? Um, I'd like to have more regular outings um, just on a regular basis, like maybe a monthly outing to start with. And then because of COVID, I know things are so difficult, but when you're outside, I mean, it's a, it's a little easier, but um, and, and maybe have some continual monitoring, like the guardianships, you know, like the, something like that, a guardianship program for TFN, um, including the youth. I think that would be really cool. I always wanted to make uh, sweatshirts that say like land steward <laughs> oh, <laughs> <them or something. laughs> so that would be really cool and I'd love to be a part of that and help bring bring people out and you know I don't think it's just for youth too I always feel that if, if we can if there are adults or young adults that want to learn because my passion started so late so or it didn't start late but I didn't start doing things till later in life because I always wanted to be like an environmentalist when I was little <laughs> but um, I didn't actually start taking action or following that passion till a very later age so I encourage older young adults as well and, and adults so yeah that's great that's not an uncommon story either a lot of people don't really get involved in, in um, you know their passions or any kind of activism or, or actions to do with you know stewardship until they're older um, and it's never too late to to learn, never too late to get an education or start a program, never too early either. As you yeah, show. exactly. <laughs> yeah, and just share with everyone actually what, at what age did you start school again? So you started the Native Education um, program at what age? <laughs> 29. <laughs> 29. Any yeah. age, yeah. yeah. One year old, any age can, I think lifelong <laughs> learning <laughs> is key. Yeah. But, yeah. Thanks so much, Robin. We'll 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 touch base again at the end of the okay. program. But thank you, you guys. Presentation. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna pass it off now to Peter. For yeah, next. that brings us to uh, talking about more kind of intergenerational thinking and thinking about you know our past generations and our future generations and and thinking about it in like a kind of seven generation uh, kind of worldview mindset. Uh, I'm gonna show a little video actually on it um, from. Yeah, it's a the seven generation philosophy from Haudenosaunee culture. Uh, the yeah, this teaching uh, intensifies the, the bond of community, promotes stability, and provides concrete values with uh, with which each person contests uh, their everyday actions. Although the Haudenosaunee practice ancient traditions, their culture is not frozen in the past. Their ability to adapt and uh, to dramatic change and survive on their own terms is historically proven and they are equally focused on the security of future generations. So let's get this uh, video up here. And it might be a little bit quiet. Um, I think it's as loud as it can go, but um, yeah, maybe you can turn it up for a little bit on this and then, yeah. Just a little bit of a warning, it might be quiet. It's timely, actually, that we're considering things like sustainability and resiliency as we prepare uh, for the generations that are coming after us. There's a teaching that's found within many indigenous cultures 
that talks about uh, the seven generations, the need to consider our impacts on each other, on our environment, and for those faces who have yet to come. So when you see the seven generations represented in a pictograph or within an illustration, you'll see that these seven figures are connected. You'll see that there's a thread that binds all of them. And this again reinforces and really causes us to consider our relation, our interconnection and our dependency on each other from those that have come before us and for those that will come after us. The teaching places us within a continuum whereby each one of us as parents, you know, and for many of us, we've been lucky to spend time with them, to learn from them and to teach them. We've also therefore had grandparents. Many of us are lucky that we've had time to spend with them, to learn from them and to teach them. And though many of us don't remember it and perhaps neither do they, we have had time with our great grandparents. We've had time to learn from them, to teach them and really uh, absorb some of their journeys within uh, their time on Mother Earth. If we're lucky, uh, we'll each have a child. We'll have time to learn from them and to teach them. If we're really lucky, we'll also be able to spend time with our grandchildren. We'll have time to learn from them, we'll have time to teach them. And if we're really lucky, we'll be able to spend time with our great grandchildren. The point being though, is that each one of us spends time in each one of those areas. We spend time as a great grandparent, a grandparent, you know, a parent, a child, a grandchild, and a great grandchild. And so the foundational principle of the seven generations, as I know it to be, is that our choices, our behaviors, and our mistakes reverberate that far throughout history. And so really we challenge ourselves, we challenge each other to make our decisions and our impacts within creation, within that timeline to respect and care for those seven generations. All right, I hope you all got to hear that. Um, but yeah, the video really just talks about how, you know, our actions, our, our intentions, our, our mistakes and everything um, kind of is, is felt and it reverberates throughout the generations uh, in time. And uh, that's why we have to be so aware of like any even small changes that are happening now because they might they might grow, they might continue, they might get bigger over time. Uh, and it's, it's really important for all, all ages, all generations to be kind of communicating about these things and thinking and talking about them. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that teachings like this are, you know, you know there's teachings just like this are very relevant uh, in many indigenous cultures all across Turtle Islands. Uh, Turtle Island being North America um, or the Americas. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's really important that we're all kind of thinking about this, uh, learning from from other teachings even, like this uh, Haudenosaunee teaching, um, and really exploring our own our own teachings on on stewardship too. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, begin to introduce our, our next guest though. Our next guest is Mercedes Robinson. Oh, sorry, the film's playing again. Um, yeah, Mercedes Robinson is, uh, yeah, grew up in her own home territory of Kitasu or uh, Hayes uh, Nation alongside um, grizzlies, black bears, and spirit bears in the Great Bear Rainforest on the central coast of uh, British Columbia. At the age of 19, Mercedes has already interned with the Spirit Bear Research Foundation connecting non-invasive Bear research um, has guided international tours at the world-renowned Spirit Bear Lodge and was featured in the Great Bear Rainforest IMAX movie that has been viewed by audiences all around the world. So if you haven't seen that, give that a check that out. Great IMAX film. But without further ado, I'd like to invite Mercedes up to share a little bit about uh, her. Hi. Hi. How yeah. are you today? I'm doing good. Nice. I'm excited to my presentation to everyone who's watching from home. So great, yeah. So should Let's I go. start? Yes, yeah, once you have it uh, um, 
your screen shared. I can put it up here. Okay. Yes. One second. Um, right here. Okay. Oh, great. Can you see my screen? Let's check. Yes. Okay. All right, take it away. Okay, cool. So today I'll be talking about my experiences growing up in my hometown and just the things that I've um, done so far. Um, yeah, so I grew up in my hometown and I learned a lot of the teachings and protocols and um, a lot of the culture was I was really immersed in a lot of the culture within the school with my family and friends. Um, so, yeah. So I started, I was involved with a lot of projects and activities. You can see in the middle picture, I was cutting fish and um, I was lucky enough to have a lot of experience with um, being out in the territory pretty often and um, being surrounded by a lot of wildlife. And yeah, so I'll be showing a few more pictures of the things that I've seen. Um, where my work experience began was with the SEAS program back in 2012 or 2013. I'm pretty sure it was 2013. Um, that was my first job and there was a posting that summer and I was pretty interested in it. So I applied and I got in with um, three other youth. The first year it was me and three other youth. And you can see in the bottom right corner, there's a graph on the rock that we painted. Um, and that just represented a story that um, yeah, that's told in our area. And yeah, so we wanted to make a symbol of um, the story close to where it um, is told. And yeah, so in the other pictures, you can see me with the other youth. And in the middle picture here, we built this shelter on a beach. And in the bottom middle picture, I was um, the the program coordinator would bring in different people to teach us things like archaeologists and biologists. And this guy here was a survival guy, um, so he was teaching us like um, how to build your own shelter and how to make a fire if you don't have a lighter or anything. So here I was building a fire, and yeah, we did some canoe journeys and just got out into the territory pretty often in different areas. So, yeah, I've had a lot of experiences. I've done some net fishing and some harvest of asparagus in this middle picture and some fishing and I built a drum and um, harvested medicines to make different medicines. Um, I've also, yeah, so those are a handful of things that I've done as well as um, some protecting and research along with learning. Um, so me and my youth, um, who I was working with put up this sign that said trophy hunting is closed in the Great Bear Rainforest in one of the estuaries because that was around the time that trophy hunting was closed. In the rest of the pictures here, you can see um, I worked on last year setting up a lot of remote cameras in an estuary. And right now we're just 
or in the teachers were testing out the camera to make sure it worked well. And this is the time that we came back to the camera to see how it was and just to check up on it. So we were um, looking through the photos and looking at some of the pictures that we got. And yeah, so in order to make sure the camera works well, we have to do some testing of the remote cameras. So in the top right, you can see I was testing out the camera. And yeah, so here are some more pictures. Um, in the top left, I was telling a story. I did some storytelling with um, a local youth group, another youth group called the SUWA program. And we would do um, tours, tours at the big house. And yeah, and you can see there's, there I am laying on the beach where a bear laid and crossing a river and just driving a boat and in the bottom left corner i was under like a cliff um overhang and i actually found um found a old uh like treasure box thing it's almost like a burial box but it was smaller oh what's that yeah and then a lot of exploring and harvesting. Um, on the top left photo, I caught a, caught a flounder and was just doing some exploring with my peers. And in the middle photo, that was another test photo, or we were comparing to a bear who walked by that tree. And that was how tall the bear was compared to my height. Um, yeah, some more exploring and living amongst the wildlife. And you can see the bear in the middle photo and a waterfall and some just estuary photos of where I spent a lot of time last summer. Um, yeah, my, and like my experiences, I've been lucky to have a lot of experiences that led me to opportunities such as the IMAX and um, working with the Spirit Bear Research Foundation, I, yeah, that's how I got to work with the IMAX film. And so that was a pretty cool experience. I didn't realize how big of a project it was at first. When my coworker asked me, I was like, oh yeah, sure. And then they um, came in to interview me and do some filming and they had some massive cameras and it was pretty surprising, but it was also really cool to do that and participate in that and be such a be part of such a big project. Um, so those, I think, the IMAX is one of the highlights of my experiences, and yeah, those are pretty much how they led to one another. Was I started with the Seas program, and that led me to work with the tours or with the lodge, the local lodge doing bear tours and wildlife tours with the lodge and that um, that gave me some experience working with people from all over the world and yeah that led me to working with the since the lodge wasn't working last year I had the opportunity to do a project um, with the bears and the remote cameras, so I set up about 40 to 50 remote cameras and then we were setting them up to monitor the bear's behavior to see if there's a difference in their behavior compared to when there are tourists and when there are no tourists to see if, yeah, if there are any major changes. And yeah, so those are some, those are the main things that I've worked on for research. I also did some more non-invasive um, bear studies by setting up barbed wire in an, in, a, in different areas around the territory. And we would end in the center of the barbed wire and the bears would be attracted to, attracted to it, but it wouldn't harm them or anything. But the barbed wire would 
would catch their fur and we would go and collect it. And you can see in the top left photo, that's what I'm doing. I'm collecting some hair off of the tree because sometimes we'd um, wrap trees with barbed wire as well because a lot of bears rub on the rub trees to get their hands. And it's like a way of communicating in the in a trail as well as with the stomp trails that lead up to the rub trees. They use their paws and their scent glands to put their scent into the into the trail so that they other bears know that they're there and stuff like that. And as you can see this top left photo, I was those were all of the remote cameras that I had to set up with specific settings to be put out into the territory. And so that was a lot of work and took about a few weeks and yeah, that was pretty a pretty cool experience and I'll be most likely doing the same thing this summer alongside one of my coworkers and helping her with that and doing different, doing more research as well. And in this other, you can see a lot of food and with the SEAS program, um, the coordinator brought in an ethnobotanist, her name is Fiona Chambers, and she taught us a lot about stuff like that and edible foods that we can harvest and stuff. So she also taught us how to do a traditional pit cook. And so I was helping her with that. And we would, in this in this pit cook, we had to dig out an air, put the food in and then cover it with leaves and stuff to make sure the dirt doesn't get on it. And then cover it with dirt and you'd use a piece of a the bull kelp as a hose and you would dump um, water into the, the into the bull kelp and then well actually you'd you would burn the fire first so that so that the food could cook properly and then you'd put the food in and then cover it all and then it would be there for a few hours and then we would all we all ate the food afterwards and in this bottom left photo I'm just in one of our old um, traditional stadiums it's called Dishju. Um, a lot of our ancestors went to go potlatch there when there was a potlatch ban they would go out in the stormy weather so that no one could see them or know that they're there and that was it was always cool to go there Most of the things that have led me to today, um, we actually found with my crew that I worked with last summer, we found a bear skeleton that was most likely a young bear that was attacked or something. We're not too sure, but we found its skeleton and its skull. And that's a picture that we took with that. And yeah, this was just my crew that I worked with last summer throughout the month. Um, yeah, they were a great crew and I'm happy I got to work with them and I'm happy I've gotten the opportunity to work with a handful of people from my hometown and people from out of town as well. And yeah, it's given me a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and I'm happy to teach that knowledge to other people today. And um, right now I'm studying at the University of Victoria in the social sciences department and I'm leaning towards um, majoring in environmental studies and geography and hopefully that'll eventually help me uh, protect and yeah preserve my territory in the future and I can go back and do more work there and yeah that's mostly that's mostly everything that I've done I think. Yeah. Wow, thank you so much for sharing everything. Um, your territories look so beautiful. I don't think I've ever been there, but uh, I'd really like to visit sometime. Um, yeah, I really yeah, it's did cool. all the, yeah, all the technology you have for studying bears and everything. 
Yeah, it's been super cool um, to work with so many people and I've gotten the opportunity to work with a lot of people from out of town that come into the community. And one of the ladies who I work with, um, she actually went to UVic and she became a doctor so she can like write a lot of papers and stuff like that. So she's super knowledgeable and one of my like mentors that I look up to. Mm, that's great. Um, I think we just got a few more things to finish up and then we'll have you come back for questions. I'm sure we've gonna, we're going to have a lot of questions about bears. I'm already thinking of some right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very impressive. Yeah. The, all the experience you've, you've had already, Mercedes, and I'm sure lots of people will have questions. I just wanted to ask too, so you mentioned the SEAS program, which is the um, Supporting Emerging Aboriginal Stewards Program. So if yeah. you haven't heard from it, about it, um, you can learn more here. And that's the program that basically launched uh, Mercedes into the, all the different experiences she's gotten into. But just um, let everyone know what age did you start um, that first internship where you mm -hmm. got an opportunity and then wanted to apply for, for that summer internship program? Yeah, so I was only 12 when I saw the posting and then like that summer I turned 13. So like ever since then I've been working each summer over the years with different summer jobs. And I worked with the SEAS program for three years. And I also worked with the tourism for two years and then just did a different research stuff with the sweeper research and yeah, with the stewardship office at home. I've done some work with them too. Amazing. And I also forgot, I was going to tell a bit of a, a story, oh, which was another highlight um, with the stewardship office last year. Um, me and other youth uh, had the privilege of um, receiving, or the, the territory and the community had the privilege of receiving um, old ancestral remains um, who were, um, that was returned back from a museum. So we had the privilege of finding um, where the remains were taken from because there was an archeologist who described where he took it from, but he wasn't supposed to take it. He was like, he said he was a professional, but he wasn't that professional and he took the remains and he, I'm not sure what happened, but the museum ended up having it. And then we had the, we had the, privilege of finding where it was taken from. And then last fall, it was placed back to where it rightfully belonged. So that was another cool experience that I got to work with other youth to do. Yeah, that's huge work, wow. Yeah, that's an amazing opportunity. And just, yeah, all the different um, opportunities that you've had to be a part of research and, and with, with the archeology. span um, it's pretty impressive. So thank you. Also, uh, super. <laughs> thank you. And one more thing. When I was really young, when Enbridge was um, about to go through our territory, they had a JRP panel and I was like 10 or 11 or something. And I spoke on the panel to um, the, yeah, along with like elders and other youth. And I spoke to address them and like tell them why I didn't want Enbridge to go through the territory. Wow. Really done, out. Yeah, you've done so much in your young age and I'm sure you have a very um, long journey ahead as well with many great things that you'll be doing. So we'd love <sighs> to stay updated on that. But I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna put you backstage for now. We'll come back for questions at the very end. I'm just gonna finish off. So um whoops oh sorry there so so yeah there's so many great people um and young inspiring young leaders out there um, many of you have probably heard now of greta thunberg but there are so many more out there that are are doing incredible work in their communities so here's just a highlight of some other young people if you haven't heard of them i recommend just looking into their stories as well and what they're doing in in, in their countries and their places all over the world 
Um, a lot of these are under 20 and some started when they were eight years old. But again, any age, you can start at any age um, if you're passionate about something. So I'm gonna show this next last video before we launch into questions. And this is basically how to start a movement. So it's um, uh, very, it's a serious movie, it's very, or it's film. So take notes, but um, even if you maybe aren't the type to take a lead, there's ways to help um, drive a movement. And so here's some key lessons to, to see what you need to start a movement. All right. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Okay, <laughs> just wanted to show that because it's uh, it's pretty incredible what what can happen when there is a movement started and there's momentum. So yeah, so it really is a matter of, of figuring out where you want to be and in, in if you want to be that leader, it's great. If you want to be part of the movement, you can also um, do that as well. So just a quick uh, final thing before we launch into questions. Um, because there's so many great things that people are doing out in the community. We're launching the Student Innovation Challenge um, and Raincoast is partnering with Take a Stand Youth for Conservation to put out these, this challenge to all the great people and all the great things that everyone is doing in their community. So if you have a great project or research or thing you're doing in their community to gain awareness on an issue um, or wildlife or, or conservation, um, we'd love to hear it. And so we're asking for entries and, and showcasing it in a virtual event that will help basically share all these different stories. And so you can pick a, a, a method that you would love to share. It could be a video, a narrative, or a creative expression. Um, and we're gonna launch this contest and be able to feature some, some cool stories from what's been um, done throughout, throughout the province and throughout uh, different areas. 
So if you are interested in that, just email me, Maureen, at raincoast.org. Um, and yeah, I think because this is our last episode, um, we would love to, to hear feedback from everybody. So after this, we're going to be sending um, just a follow-up. And if you love this program or if you'd love to get more, all of our programs are 100% free. And um, feedback from you guys allows us to, to give more programs to the community. So we'd love for your feedback on this. But yeah, without further ado, we're going to launch into questions. Um, I know there's a, a little bit tight on time, but if you have to leave, that's okay. But if you can stay for questions, that's great. We're just going to pass it off to our first, our classroom. Um, if you guys have any questions for any of our panelists or guests today, and then we can take questions as well from our live audience streaming. Uh, we have a question from a student. Um, it's for Mercedes. Did she ever get to sleep in a shelter that she over to Did you hear that, Sorry, Mercedes? Sorry, what was that question? Sorry. No. Um, did you ever sleep in a shelter that you made yourself overnight? Oh, um, personally, I haven't, but a lot of my friends, the my friends in future years who worked with the same program, they did to take turns. Um, yeah, they had to take turns like keeping the fire lit and stuff. But I heard it was pretty fun. We have another question from a student. Okay, go for it. Um. So ask it for him. He uh, this is from Jaden. Uh, what's the biggest fish you've ever caught? <laughs> is that <good? laughs> Do you want to go first, sure. Mercedes? Sure. Um, I think the biggest one that I've caught is a ling cod. Um, I haven't caught a halibut yet, but hopefully I will one day. But yeah, I think the biggest one I've caught was the ling cod. Cool. Um, I would say, I was going to say a spring salmon, a big spring salmon, but it's actually um, a giant sturgeon that was probably like 10 feet long or something. Oh my but, gosh. Yeah, they, when we fish in Canoe Pass, it's really shallow there and, and um, you can tell if a sturgeon hits your net because it goes into a big V and you can see it, they just hit it and they just pull it. So. They, but they don't, they, they they have like an exoskeleton and they're called scoots and they're little, the lip, they all face the same way and that makes it quite difficult to untangle them sometimes. But they're such strong, sturdy fish. Like I'm not too, never really worried about them when they get caught in the net. But um, that one was quite a, a hassle to get out because like you can't bring it on the boat. So I'm like hanging over the boat, cutting some meshes and like rolling it out practically. But it was cool. I love sturgeon. I think they're one of my favorites. Thank you. All right. So, all right. I have a question for both of you. So throughout like all of your experiences that you've had, what is one of the biggest lessons you've learned or what is something you really realized doing all of this? Do you want to go first? <laughs> Um, I can if you want. It's up to you. I feel like a big lesson that I've learned is to um, just always respect the land and territory and animals that you live with, and um, yeah, to just remember to like, yeah, just be respectful of everything, all living things, and um, yeah, to like protect and like preserve everything and so that it can be used in future generations and that future generations have the opportunity to use all of the things that we have too and yeah just to um be like just keep learning and be like curious of your surroundings just to keep learning more about where you are and then you can use that to find your passion and 
use that towards whatever you want to do in your life. Nice. Yeah. Wonderful. I would totally agree. Um, I think something else that I learned is to just go for it. Um, I was hesitant to go to school um, and leave my position that I had because I lost the security of it and was worried about afterwards. But then I was just like, you know what, just go for it. This is something you've been like wanting to do. And um, yeah, so just go for it. And then also um, being aware so you have the opportunity to care, <laughs> but like going out and taking the initiative to learn about your surrounding lands that you are living on. And because um, the more you learn and the more you know, then the more information and knowledge you have to better, better protect or better care or, or yeah, things like that. <laughs> so yeah. And sharing is caring, <laughs> sharing <Anyway>. knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. I think we have a, a little bit of time for some comments online too, some questions and comments. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a lot of engagement today. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess first question, I think for Robin during your presentation um, is, what is oh. purseing? Would you tell us a little, little bit more about that? Sure. Um, it's. Um, a type of staining where you, it's, it's called a pursing because um, there's a cork line that goes around the top that sits on the, the top of the water. And then the lead line actually has loops and a rope that goes all the way through the whole loops. So when you pull it tight, it cinches in the bottom like a little purse and it captures everything. And then you slowly bring it in from one side and everything will gather into one corner of the net and then it, they're all kind of pooled there and then you scoop them out and put them in the buckets with their little filters and stuff, all the little fish. Um, I hope that explains it. <laughs> but yeah, that's purse staining. That was my first time purse staining too, um, going out there with Rinko. So that was really fun for me as well. And I'm so used to catching salmon and, and sockeye and chum. So all these big salmon and to see all these teeny tiny little fish out there was really, was a different experience for myself. So that was cool. Nice. We also got a lot of praise for you too. Uh, <laughs> for Robin and, and for both of you. Yeah. Love to see it. Thanks so much. We also have one question from Facebook. I think it's for us as Rain Coast. Are you on YouTube as well? Uh, are either of you two guests on YouTube? No. <laughs> no. Uh, Rain Coast is. You can find them, uh, Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, uh, on YouTube. Uh, all of our live streams are also going to be on YouTube, and same with uh, Coastal Insights Season 1. You can see a lot of great episodes from, from last season also. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank both of you for your, your inspiring stories and, and sharing your journeys with us today. And We hope to stay updated. I know there's lots of great things to come for both of you. Um, and I'm just going to pull on pull up the, the classroom back. Thanks for joining. Do you want to say a quick goodbye? Big wave. Shout to everyone. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, and then, yeah, we just want to say one final thank you to all of our sponsors. So thank you, everyone, uh, who helped make all of our Rainco's education programs possible. Um, we have lots of great supporters out there, and we'd love to do more. But thank everyone for joining. This is our final episode, but uh, to be continued. There'll be more great things to come, sure. Yes. Okay, thanks all. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.